we'll begin by refreshing memories as to what went before in discussing the theme of the Joker I have been talking about a point of view the Joker's point of view from which not only our social institutions but also all the formations of the natural world are seen as games Be careful of the word game. It doesn't mean as trivialities. Because when we say it's just a game, this often means it is just trivial. There can be important games. As when we play the piano or musical instruments, we are not necessarily doing something frivolous, but we are playing. And there is something in the nature of all play that is not serious, but at the same time may be sincere. And I tried to give you the picture of the multiplicity of natural forms on the one hand, and of human social institutions, and all the things that we do and consider important and busy ourselves with as human beings. I tried to give you the point of view from which these can be seen as games, as things being done, as it were, simply for themselves. And not for some uh, ulterior motive. And therefore, these games are in a way best played when they are played as games. Although, it's really all right for people to take them seriously, except that they are a little bit deprived. They're missing something. And so when the Joker sees a person taking his life seriously and regarding himself as extremely important, there is something a little bit funny about it, and he is inclined to get the giggles. And it's, it's all he knows that the, the very intensity of seriousness with which the individuals concerned are taking these games will be a kind of foil for the subsequent uh, bursting into laughter when he sees that it wasn't serious after all. You see that? Uh, you might say there are these classes of people. There are the very far out people and the very far in people. Now ordinarily we say someone's very far out when they are oddball, when they are exceedingly unconventional. But I want you to turn the picture around and look as a conventional person. Look at a square as a person who's very far out. That is to say, he is so involved in the seriousness of the game he is playing that he is lost. He doesn't know where he started from and he thinks he's there. <laughs> but he's completely lost because he is actually uh, under the cover of his assurance, of his status, of his position in society. He's really a very anxious person. I said a lot yesterday about the way in which our society shows anxiety because it cannot permit the existence of people who don't belong. And it cannot really permit the criticism of laughter. It cannot permit the presence of the old-fashioned court jester. Because these people are so far out. They are so involved and from a certain standpoint, you see, from the Joker's standpoint, he doesn't condemn such people. He rather congratulates them on their heroism for getting so lost and involved. But to keep the far out people from going quite insane, there have to be far in people. And the far in people are those who, who keep contact with the original goings on behind the scenes. They are like the prompter in the theater. Well, there are the actors out on the stage, 
relying on their memories, etc., and they're supposed to get completely involved in the play. But there's a concealed prompter with the script in front of him. And he is the connection of the actor on the stage with the green room behind the stage. And you see in, in this dramatic analogy of the universe, the green room is the central point, the still point of the turning world. The green room is how uh, God is when he's back home, not involved in all these games, and takes off the mask. See, uh, on the Hindu theory that everybody is a mask of God. Like a uh, wonderful line in one of Chesterton's poems. And now a great thing in the street seems any human nod, where move in strange democracy the million masks of God. The million masks of the Joker, because the Joker is the player, the trick player, who plays ultimately the great trick on himself. So really, there can be no resentment about this. Nobody to blame, nobody to turn around to in the end and say, you, you bastard, you did this to me. Because it's always you who are ultimately responsible. So, this prompter, you see, keeps the actor on the stage in touch with the green room. And so there are certain people in the world who uh, might be a kind of a priesthood sometimes, although priesthoods are apt to become corrupt and uh, square. Uh, but a kind of people in the know. There always has to be somebody around somebody in the know. So that, uh, as it were, the wheel of society and of existence, the wheel of the squirrel cage, the wheel of the rat race, can have an axle firmly planted. And at the center then there have to be the far in people. So this is the domain of jokers. Now, having developed that side of the Joker, the person who sees uh, through the social institutions of games, I went on in the second session to discuss another aspect of the Joker as the sly man. In comparison with the monk, the fakir, and the yogi, who undertake, all those three, undertake in certain different ways, disciplines, which have the intent of releasing them from their karma. The individual, in other words, challenges his involvement, his attachments, his limitations, his finitude, and endeavors to overcome it. But in each of these three cases, the individual involved stirs up an immense opposition. Because he serves notice upon the devil, or shall we say, upon his karmic creditors that he is about to leave town. And so all the creditors come rushing to the door. All his past sins catch up with him. And the devil lays his temptations in the way all the more thoroughly. So that the sly man is the one who, when he is going to leave town, does so instantaneously without any prior announcement. And so in this way there is, shall we say, a cunning manner of becoming a Buddha. And that is to become one instantly, without any preparation or warning whatsoever. This is why Zen is called the sudden school, and why Satori is uh, a sudden awakening. Because it has to be done without the slightest warning. Now, this is our eternal problem. We are in the state of egocentric consciousness, firmly convinced that death is a threat. We are so convinced of this, even though individuals may say, well, I'm not really afraid of death. What I'm afraid of is dying in an unpleasant way. Nevertheless, since almost all uh, moralists and uh, people concerned with ethics 
seem to agree, whatever their differences of opinion, that survival is a good thing. In some sense, if not survival in this body, the, even the most, uh, I mean, the people who would rather be dead than red, firmly believe that that is true because they believe there is a hereafter where they can go and where they can be rewarded for the courageous stand against evil which they have taken. You see? So that's still some kind of insistence on the, vi the, the value of survival. And we all cling to this idea of survival with tremendous passion. But we have been fooled because survival is an important ideal only so long as you have bothering you the bugbear of death that the world might stop altogether and that your death so far as you are concerned is curtains forever but there are other people who so cherish the unique that they can conceive the idea of uh, something like existence happening only once. But I always say, and I feel it in a sort of funny, intuitive way, that what happened once can happen again. If this world started at some time, supposing there was a colossal explosion which set all these galaxies flying out, then what existed before that explosion must surely have been something like the stable state to which we shall run down in the end. And if it went bang once, there's absolutely no reason why it shouldn't go bang again. So there isn't just one vibration. And uh, a dit but no da sort of thing. Uh, you, you have to have it do more. So in, in just the same way, when you magnify this principle, there isn't just one cosmos or one big explosion that starts and stops. All stopping implies starting. Someone just wrote to me, we haven't parted because we never met. <laughs> so, the whole point of saying this is the realization that existence is eternal. The going out of existence implies the coming in. And St. Thomas had some points here when he said, there could never have been a time when there was not being. Because if there had been a time when there was nothing, there was nothing in nothing to produce something. But he didn't quite have the point because what he didn't see was that nothing is productive in the sense that you can't have nothing without something. They go together. And all this thing is an argument, again, about whether the zebra is yellow striped black or black striped yellow. And what we see is that yeah. The that one got me real good. The darkness and the oh. Oh, yeah. Are simply two phases of the same. And that realization is exactly what transforms anxiety into laughter. Suddenly to see that you just, after all this anxiety, that you don't have anything to worry about. Now, that doesn't mean that there will not in our future lie uh, some extremely painful experiences or experiences that we would ordinarily interpret as horribly painful. We may all die of ghastly diseases or of radiation burns, or of uh, 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 unimaginable things. But look here. 
I very briefly touched on pain yesterday and the way pain is interpreted. Uh, if, <clears throat> if you interpret pain as something that is destroying you and is going in the direction of total death, then it's very serious indeed. And it's perfectly terrifying. But I've been investigating experiences of people who've undergone torture. The, the worst part of torture is the beginning. When, of course, you're full of all your illusions and all your um, fears about black and white and the terror that black may win. But it's said that as torture proceeds, it slowly changes uh, the state of mind of the victim to a kind of drunken, masochistic giving in to the torture so that it becomes something that he cooperates with. And that if the, the torturer notices this, he knows he's through and has to kill him. In other words, there is a point at which pain becomes an experience without having a negative interpretation put upon it. it becomes, in other words, converted into ecstasy. It simply becomes, you see, a way of going through extraordinarily far out sensations which have no meaning. If they have meaning, the meaning of threat, the meaning of uh, death looming at the end, and you know this is the tearing apart and the destruction of you, then you see uh, it is uh, uh, absolutely horrendous. You see it depends on the set, on the way you approach the experience.